role. There are obviously political downsides to, uh, to deploying troops all over the world because there's always gonna be casualties, there's always gonna be accidents, um, and that comes at a political cost. However, we found out the hard way on 9-11, what happens when you don't engage a country like Afghanistan? It becomes a, a haven for terrorists who can plan operations against the United States. So there's a balance there. Uh, I believe the Biden folks understand that, uh, and the military is apolitical, so they'll, they'll do what the president orders them to do, but I'll tell you, they do game things out. So every possible contingency has been gamed out and, and the president is briefed on what those uh, possible outcomes are. Ultimately, I think you're gonna see uh, a, a Trump, second Trump administration being more committed to removing itself from a lot of the United, uh, from a lot of the world. Whereas I think the Biden camp is more the traditional US role for both Republicans and Democrats going back many generations. Uh, and, and administrations, uh, I think you'll see a greater American presence overseas, knowing full well that that comes with uh, a political downside. Uh, Dr. Garrett, I'd like to go back to you. Um, I mean, we're having this conversation about foreign policy because so much of a president's job is foreign policy related, even if we don't necessarily um, always recognize that while we're going to the polls. So how much actually will candidates views on foreign policy affect the election compared to previous elections, um, especially given the recent impact uh, of so many domestic issues that just seem much more pressing? Yeah, great question, Brett. So I went back and looked at sort of a, an overview. Pew keeps track of, uh, in different election cycles, they ask citizens what they view as the most important concerns to them. And heading into the 2020 election, Americans actually ranked foreign policy as the sixth most important concern to them, which is down from 2016 when, <laughs> let me pause. Uh, that's down from 2016 when foreign policy was the third most important concern to Americans. And in some ways that's not really surprising with all of the concerns that we have happening domestically right now in the United States. So it's probably not any surprise that the main thing that voters are concerned about is the economy with everything that's going on with the coronavirus and the ways that people have lost jobs. That's what Americans are concerned about. So I think when we look at elections, we know that foreign policy tends to be less important than domestic policy and in influencing voters. Now, I, I think that maybe we can make a, a case that there's some indirect connections. I think that there are ways that if the candidates can make a case that their foreign policy does affect the economy, which Americans are really concerned about right, right now, and then I think that that can draw attention to foreign policy as a concern. I think you hear candidates going back and forth on how their foreign policy is gonna affect jobs, whether it's gonna bring back jobs to the United States, how it's gonna affect the manufacturing sector, whether or not tariffs or free trade are more beneficial for helping the economy. Um, so that might be something uh, Gallup keeps track of the most important problem that Americans are thinking about. And heading into this election, a lot of Americans, 25%, said the most important problem to them was government and poor leadership. And so if there are ways that candidates can tie in how their foreign policy leadership is really important to the United States and our foreign perception abroad, maybe that can, can play in. But I really think that it's uh, a little bit of sort of more of an indirect story. Um, some are saying that right now this election could come down to really being sort of a referendum on the handling of the coronavirus and then some of the things that we see going on with violence and unrest and other things like that in the United States. So I think those are pivotal and, and foreign policy sort of takes uh, a backseat unless there's some of those indirect connections that the candidates really point out. Yeah, and, and one of those indirect connections that I guess the candidates have pointed out, especially President Trump, is the connection of coronavirus to China. Um, so I'm kind of going to use this to transition to a question for Dr. McCoy, um, and maybe Captain Iglesias, if you want to comment on this as well, because you noted China um, as the top issue um, as we began. Um, but Dr. McCoy, both 
campaigns have said that they're going to be tough on China. Um, what does this actually mean? Um, and how is toughness defined for both of these candidates? Oh, I was that guy who started talking without uh, unmuting. Um, so, you know, in some ways I actually find it easier to uh, start by defining what do we mean by softness and, uh, as opposed to like, what does it mean to be tough? And, and so I think when we talk about being soft on China, we really look at a, a lot of US policy um, during the 90s and particularly during the 2000s in which China was welcomed into international institutions, most notably the World Trade Organization and the WTO. Uh, and supporting trade deals that allowed Chinese products uh, into the United States with very little protection uh, at very cheap prices, uh, while also overlooking uh, Chinese restrictions on U.S. products entering China and Chinese theft of U.S. intellectual pro uh, property. I think at least according for the issues of trade, I wouldn't expect um, either candidate, if elected or reelected, to tolerate this further. I mean, this has actually been, um, even a lot of Democrats have actually uh, complimented President Trump on his China policy, right? If, we, if, if this were a panel of Democrats and their question was, what's one area of, of President Trump's policy you've liked? You know, kind of going back to Dr. Garrett's question of partisanship, you'd probably universally see, hear them say China, right? It's, it's like the one policy even Democrats feel like, yes, we were soft on China too long. We agree with uh, President Trump being tougher on China. And, and so I would expect that certainly rhetorically and probably in substance, to remain consistent regardless of who's um, elected. Regarding welcoming China into international institutions, it's possible, I, I doubt it, but it's, I would not rule out uh, President Trump threatening to withdraw from institutions if China remains present, particularly, the, again, the World Trade Organization. The WTO has become an increasing uh, punching bag, particularly on the, on the nationalist right. Uh, Senator Josh Hawley had a column in your opinion piece in New York Times calling for uh, U.S. withdrawal or just the abolishment of the WTO. Um, but I also just want to specify what softness has not meant. What softness has not meant um, has been abandoning any type of alliance system against China. The United States has had a consistent alliance encirclement policy against China um, almost as long as the history of the PRC, although that's often when the US, you know, Chinese approached Ma in the, in the 70s, but the US has maintained a strong encirclement around China uh, since the 90s, drawing in uh, even, you know, Vietnam uh, into that. And I would expect that to continue and I expect to see a tougher position on Chinese expansion into the South China Seas. And again, I would expect that from, from either administration. So, um, uh, one that's come up and, you know, even came up uh, in our U.S. foreign policy class today would, was what would U.S. policy be towards Taiwan? Should we see, see a change there? I'm actually surprised how little President Trump talks about Taiwan. Uh, he, he talks about it some, but he doesn't talk about much of a change in policy there. And again, I, I wouldn't expect to see much change there. So um, beyond whether the U.S. threatens to pull itself out of institutions, I expect uh, both presidents to have a tougher trade policy in terms of um, particularly not tolerating uh, any type of theft of uh, intellectual property. Uh, I would expect the Biden administration to also maintain a hard line on Huawei and then further strengthening uh, alliances encircling China. Captain Iglesias, do you care to comment on that one? Just very briefly, and I do note that my friend and colleague, Dr. McCoy, did live in the People's Republic of China uh, for a number of years. So True. He's, he's got, he's got a, I think, an insight that, uh, that, that few academics uh, here at Wheaton have. Um, I remember when Nixon and Kissinger went and opened up China uh, back in the 70s. And I remember the prevailing thought was, if we welcome them to the community of nations, they, they will abide by the rule of law, they will play by the rules. And here we are 50 years later. Uh, and like any other country, uh, especially a, a large country with huge natural resources and human resources, they're, they're going to be looking out for their own national interests first. So I think that became... Uh, uh, that, that came as a shock or a surprise to a, a lot in Washington, D.C. So we're struggling to understand, uh, does China want to uh, be a key player in the, war, in, the, in the community of nations or does it want to create another bipolar world? 
Uh, well, you've got, in, in, in my view, two fairly stark choices uh, with the Biden or Trump people. The Trump people uh, are going to maintain a hard line, I think. Biden's probably not so much. I think Biden has his eyes open, but I don't think you're, you would see the same type of, of hard line position against China that you would see in the Trump administration. And, and I agree uh, with what Dr. McCoy say that the, that the ongoing theory, at least with the Trump folks, would be uh, containment and uh, encirclement. Uh, all right, I have another question for you, actually, Captain Iglesias. Um, what what do you see as the biggest differences uh, between Biden and Trump's national security policy? So, picture two words: uh, globalist uh, would be one word, or nationalist. So, with the Biden folks, you have a traditional politician. And again, th this isn't just a democratic issue because you can point out to Republican administrations who have been globalist. They believe in forming alliances with other countries. Uh, they believe in maintaining the, the status quo, maintaining the world order. Whereas with, uh, with the Trump administration, you have uh, a, a nationalist, uh, somebody who puts America first to the detriment of our alliances. And that affects all kinds of uh, alliances, including NATO, for example. Um, so uh, I, that, that plays its way out, I believe. And do we want to return to the pro-Trump uh, era in which Republican and Democratic administrations did uh, view things in terms of we and not us? Or do you want to maintain the status quo as it began in 2016? So I think the differences are, are fairly stark uh, and it's gonna be up to the American voter to pick which way we're gonna go forward, obviously. Uh, Dr. Garrett, I have another question for you. Uh, this particularly relates to how um, the, the different candidates might conduct foreign policy in the very different wake of, of COVID-19. Um, how, how do you take Trump versus Biden's strategy for foreign policy, um, given all the ways that, that it has changed um, during the pandemic. You're muted. I'm muted, thank you. So I think that in a lot of ways, Captain Iglesias sort of uh, covered really well differences between the two candidates in terms of their grand strategy with foreign policy. Um, I don't know how much the coronavirus changes those perceptions of how they're thinking about foreign policy. Um, Trump won as part of his campaign, campaign platform in 2016 of putting America first. And as part of that strategy, he was pursuing overturning what he, he saw to be unfair trade deals and trying to put pressure on US allies to pay more towards joint defense measures, and so in a lot of ways, it was sort of, uh, let's put America first. And I could see that continuing into uh, a second term, whereas, uh, pre whereas Vice President Biden has pledged to really sort of change some of those stances to put the US uh, at a strong position of global, global leadership and reverse some of Trump's actions to try and take steps to strengthen our ties with allies, there are ways that I think that um, Vice President Biden was less supportive of tariffs than President Trump has been, and he would be more supportive of our involvement with international organizations, so plans to rejoin the Paris, the Paris Climate Agreement, to strengthen ties with NATO, uh, to rejoin something like the Iran nuclear deal. And there are a lot of ways that I think that right now uh, Biden is running sort of uh, against some of what have been Trump's uh, foreign policies. Or I think Dr. McCoy, you might have referenced tone. One of the things that's interesting to me is that if you look at it, there aren't a ton of differences on some on some policy. I want to be clear, there, there are some very big differences, but a lot of it also comes down to tone. And so 
um, Biden has even run ads that have pointed out the question, um, you know, what is the foreign perception of the United States under the Trump administration? He ran an ad called uh, The World is Laughing at President Trump. And so I think you see key differences that would continue under the two, uh, under uh, the Trump administration or that would be different under the, the Biden administration in line with what Captain Iglesias was mentioning. Yeah, and, and Dr. Garrett, you mentioned uh, the Iran deal. So I'd like uh, to turn to Dr. McCoy here. What could we expect from both candidates in terms of nuclear politics, um, especially with the upcoming expiration uh, of the New START Treaty and with Trump's withdrawal from the JCPOA with uh, Iran deal? Um, could we expect a Biden administration um, to try and rejoin that agreement? So I admit for both of these, I'm pessimistic. Uh, that for, for the JCPOA, I'll, I'll start with that one since Dr. Garrett referenced it. So JCPOA, that's the official acronym for what we commonly call the Iran nuclear deal. Um, so I was, so this was, you know, so before the time of, you know, any of the students here, when the uh, Iran nuclear deal was first negotiated, Captain Iglesias and I had a debate uh, as one of our hot topics on the Iran nuclear deal. And Captain Iglesias spoke in opposition to it. I spoke in favor of it. And I spoke in favor of it because I felt like this was actually, you know, this was frankly, um, I, I, I was skeptical at all about, about achieving denuclearization in Iran. And I felt like the Obama administration had uh, accomplished this. And I thought this was a major achievement. In the years since, I still think the agreement on paper was good, but I'm much more... Um, disappointed with how President Obama negotiated it. I think it was it was a rush negotiation and he frankly promised things he couldn't promise. So he promised to lift, because he promised that the United States would essentially lift all its sanctions on Iran uh, in exchange for Iran and its nuclear program. Well, the president can't do that. That needs to be done through Congress. And I subsequently also learned that many of these sanctions are not even you know federal sanctions. These are state sanctions, which means individual state legislatures pass these. So these are acts of law, which only a legislature can overturn. I don't think the Biden administration has uh, the will or the ability to really you know to get that done. And so um, by President Trump so precipitously pulling out, uh, that broke what little bit of kind of maybe trust there was with Iran. It really undercut the moderates in Tehran who had negotiated this. And so I don't, even if uh, a President Biden was more rhetorically favorable towards it, which I expect, I don't know that the U.S. could reenter. I don't know that Iran would allow the U.S. to reenter. Having said that, so now that I've been pessimistic about it, the one, part, the major part that I'm optimistic about, though, is this was not a U.S.-Iran agreement. This was an agreement between Iran and what were known as the P5 plus one, which were the five permanent members of the Security Council plus Germany. Well, P4 plus one have still remained committed. So hopefully, and again, this is kind of going back to the Obama doctrine question, hopefully other countries remaining committed will be enough to keep Iran uh, denuclearized. And I'm mildly optimistic that it will, but that remains to be seen. I do though broadly expect, um, Biden have a less belligerent attitude towards Iran in general um, than the Trump administration has. On the START Treaty, similar. Um, you know, I, I think when I think of the START Treaty, I'm thinking about the phrase, you know, where there's a will, there's a way. Well, I don't think uh, Donald Trump has the will to, re to renegotiate START, and I don't think uh, a President Biden would have the way. Uh, I expect a, a Biden administration to be so aggressively anti Russia. Like it's going to just be so anti-Russia. I don't see where the negotiating space is. I don't think from what, I've, from what Putin has said, he doesn't want a new treaty. And I, so I don't see the space for the Biden administration to do this. And I don't see President Trump caring enough to do this. Uh, you know, disarmament is not what Donald Trump is about. So, I, so I'm, yeah, so I think for both of these agreements in terms of U.S. participation, I'm pessimistic, but I think uh, the, GC, the, the JCPOA can maintain even without U.S. participation. Uh, 
I, I'd like to just remind viewers a minute. Um, we'll probably do one or two more questions here for the panelists that I have written, um, and then we'll turn it over to student questions. So just a reminder, the Slido code is 20693 if you want to go over there uh, and, and write out a question. Uh, Captain Iglesias, here's another question uh, for you. Are there any particular threats um, that you believe the president will be acutely faced with in the next four years uh, regarding Homeland Security? Yeah, so the ongoing threat is cyber threat. Um, that's something that uh, Vice President Biden would have uh, obviously experienced uh, eight years ago, but it's picked up in intensity. So even as we're speaking now, there are, there are attacks going on against the Pentagon, against the Department of Treasury, against the White House, virtually any uh, large American institution, political or economic, we're being attacked by uh, Russian, a cadre of Russians, Iranians, Chinese, organized crime. I mean, you, you name the actor. Fortunately, we catch 99.9% uh, of those and our offensive capabilities uh, are are awesome as well. But uh, all it takes is is one uh, catastrophic attack to to shut down uh, a, a segment of our country. That during this point in our history, given what's going on right now, uh, could be problematic. Uh, so I I would uh, assume and and trust that whether we have a Trump administration for the next four years or a Biden administration, that they will hire the best uh, cyber warriors, both on the civilian side and on the military side, uh, to go mano a mano uh, with our opponents. That That is the ongoing threat. I don't think we're going to see any more spectacular 9-11 style attacks because we've been able to degrade that capability. But it doesn't take uh, nearly as much in terms of finances and training to set up a fairly credible cyber attack. All right, uh, at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, the other co-president of JQAS, Abigail Acock, who has been managing student questions. Um, so Abigail, if you want to go ahead with those for our panelists, and these most of these are just gonna be general, so whoever on the panel uh, would like to respond to these. Right, so our first question that we got was, how would you evaluate Trump's impact on American-Israel relations? And what are the differences between the two candidates in terms of dealing with Israel? Um, the student also wanted to know kind of how to relate to this conflict in our Christian context as well. I'm gonna to yield to our Israel expert, Dr. McCoy. All right, so, um... So in terms of, yeah, I, I mean, I would say um, the, the re, the, between the move to the capital to Jerusalem and the negotiation of agreements with, between Israel and the Gulf states, I, I, I think these are, and I definitely strongly agree with Dr. Garrett's point about partisan lens always matters how we, what we think to be accomplishments. But I'm, I'm hard, especially the agreements with the Gulf states and Israel, I'm hard pressed to think of this as nothing but an accomplishment. I think this is something that the Trump administration can feel like hang their hat on and, and call an accomplishment. Um, the move to Jerusalem, more controversial, though, was not nearly, you know, certainly the dire predictions people had about what this move could mean did not come to pass. So... I think that I, I think these are, are strict accomplishments for the Trump administration. I doubt a Biden administration would try to retract any of these. I, I, it's possible they might try to move the embassy back to Tel Aviv. I would be kind of surprised. Um, from our Christian context, this is yeah. I mean, I so I you know I teach a class titled Israel Palestine, and we spend some time in our class you know talking about these issues. And that's this is a this is a deep topic. Um, so I'm going to give a comment, but I want to say that. This is a brief comment. There's so much more that can be said. Please don't reduce this all to a soundbite. Um, I don't personally take a stance on uh, how, as Christians, we should think about Israel. Um, is this the Israel that's prophesied? Could be. Won't rule it out. I'm, my simple answer is I don't know. And a lot of times when we talk about this in class, I refer students to you know Acts 1, where the apostles literally ask Jesus, will you restore the kingdom of heaven? And his response is, it's not for you to know times and seasons that I, I 
that my father is appointed by his own authority, but to preach the gospel to Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. So I think as Christians, we're primarily called to be people who live out the gospel, not try to figure out um, how God has appointed Israel. I think, though, that um, God seeks to bless all nations as we are seek to be a blessing in the earth. And so we're called to be good neighbors. So whether it's, you know, Israel, whether it's Palestinians, whether it's Jordan, whether it's Egypt, we're all called to be good neighbors and we can be judged on how we're neighborly towards each other in that respect. Um, and so I think as Christians, we should be people that are obeying Christ's call to be peacemakers in the earth. And how can we be facilitators of peace for a country and in a region that often has very little of it? All right, Dr. Garrett, any comments on this question in particular? Yeah, well, I was going to say thanks so much for your thoughts on that, Dr. McCoy. And you, you had mentioned that um, you didn't think that Biden would change uh, Trump's uh, decisions to move the U.S. embassy or to recognize uh, Jerusalem as Israel's capital. And I think Biden's on the record of saying that he won't make changes uh, to that because he thinks that it would um you know, complicate and, 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 and challenge the Israeli-Palestinian uh, peace process. Um, he has said that he would reopen the U.S. consulate that dealt with Palestinians, which Trump had shut down. So there's small differences, but it is interesting to see that, uh, that there are similarities between the two candidates on Israel. So I wasn't aware of that. So thank you. Um, another question from a student. Um, kind of mentioned a little bit earlier on, but how do we see the election affecting the future of military engagements abroad, um, just in a large scale sense? I was, go, go, was going to say, Captain Gleason. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, I, I think uh, I, I touched upon that um, with a prior answer about how would you describe in one word if possible the, the, the views, uh, the national security views of our two candidates? Well, you've got the nationalist view, which is to use the military as little as possible overseas. And then you've got the globalist view, which is uh, Vice President Biden, uh, who would want to use our military in a traditional sense. And by that, I mean, uh, anytime there is an American interest that needs to be protected or power projected, we're gonna do that just like President Obama and Bush and Clinton and Bush and Reagan before them would do that. I mean, that, that, that is just kind of how we use our military. We didn't just use our military uh, for war purposes. There are other purposes such as humanitarian relief. So after the tsunami in Southeast Asia, we sent our carriers there and passed out an enormous amount of uh, food and water and, 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 and provide a lot of medical care. Uh, so uh, I think, you know, it, it's, it's fashionable to say, well, the two parties aren't that different. Well, if you drill down, I, I think they are on some issues. And I think use of military is one area where the differences are, are really fairly marked. Um, and uh, I, I just hope we're not in a situation where we, we have to use our, our, our military. Uh, but I do see... Uh, us restoring a lot of the alliances that have traditionally uh, been at our disposal. NATO, for example, comes to mind. Um, and I think that, that kind of covers the basis. Uh, if I can, I'm, I, I'm, I'm gonna do one thing we haven't done this panel yet. I'm actually gonna disagree with my colleague here. Like I said, he, he and I are known to disagree occasionally. Um, and I, I'm gonna disagree with him on the area that I actually think the parties have become closer on this, uh, the use of military force. I think there's a, a, a bipartisan aversion to the use of, of military force. And I would expect, I mean, President Trump, even though I think a lot of people had these expectations that he was the sort of, you know, gonna be the sort of, you know, mil, uh, belligerent foreign power. He has not really, I mean, he's probably used US military forces less, um, he, he's used it the least of any administration of the 21st century. And again, and I, I, I would expect um, a, a President Biden to be similarly reticent. He's been reticent in his rhetoric, his record from the Obama administration was one of reticence. So I actually think, I think there is a kind of bipartisan consensus of nervousness about the use of military force. 
Okay, let, let, let me just add a little asterisk to that. I think the exception is is the use of drone warfare. Because when you use drones, which all our presidents have since it became operational, you hit a lot of targets, you kill a lot of enemies of the United States with no risk to our armed forces. Uh, so I think if you limit your, uh, your thoughts to you know, sending in a carrier task force or, or parachuting in a, 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 a brigade of, uh, of rangers, we're not going to see that from either Biden or Trump, but I think you're going to continue to see a robust use of drone warfare just because it is so much less likely to lead to body bags coming home to Dover Air Force Base. Thank you for those responses. Um, kind of making a transition um, back to China. Um, a student asked, should we believe either candidate when they say they'll impose stricter actions on China due to mistreatment of Hong Kong and ethnic minorities? Dr. McCoy? I think now the game is who gets to speak first to toss it to somebody else. Um, should we believe candidates? Um, I don't have a strong answer on that one. I mean, I... I think that I think the escalation of Hong Kong is somebody something we should keep our eyes on. I, th I think, honestly, I I really I hate the next thing I'm about to say. I I think the 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 Chinese government has done a good in an evil type of way job of suppressing information coming out of Xinjiang, and I doubt that it would lead to much overt action beyond a validation of some sanctions the United States might want to put on China. Uh, I think Hong Kong, with access to a greater media environment and with its stronger ties to the West, I could see a very, uh, if we see a sort of Tiananmen style crackdown in Hong Kong, I could imagine that would lead to a, a you know, a large global outcry. I think there would definitely, I think any type of cry, crackdown in Hong Kong would lead to a demand from our Asian allies that the United States respond strongly. Because something that hasn't been talked about is our Asian allies have not hated Trump's foreign policy, right? Our European allies have hated Trump's foreign policy. Our Asian allies have not. And they've liked his get tough on China policy, even if they don't always like his rhetoric and his unreliability on troop placements in, in Japan and Korea. I think a serious crackdown in Hong Kong could lead to demands for some type of, not necessarily military retaliation, but harsh economic retaliation. I very, very sadly, almost angrily would say that I don't think the Xinjiang policy, as terrible as it is, unless it's just some really horrible news comes out, will change the trajectory of current policy that China has in its relations with other countries. Captain Iglesias, I, I I have no I have no dispute with that. Um, and making a transition towards Latin America, a student asked, "Might we see any differences in the conduct of foreign policy in Latin America apart from immigration issues?" Iglesias. Well. Latin America is the overlooked uh, neighbor to our South. Um, having done a lot of government duty there uh, in Central and South America, um, I, 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 I think the flashpoints um, are probably Venezuela because th there is evidence showing that the Cubans are, are uh, advising the Venezuelan military. I don't see them uh, attacking Colombia because Colombia has the best trained military in probably all of Latin America. Um, I think the immigration issue uh, fuels uh, criminal justice issues, at least as regards to uh, El Salvador and Honduras, uh, for example, Guatemala to a lesser extent. Um, but, but the thing to keep in mind is where do these gangs, the MS-13s and, and the other gangs uh, get their start? They didn't get their start in Central America. They were they were deported from the United States. Uh, so, you know, it, it's easy to try to cordon off an immigration issue, but it, it, it's it's not that simple. Um, I I hope 
I've got a lot of family living in, in Latin America right now. I, I, I hope that uh, either a Biden or a Trump administration would pay more attention, but I, I don't see that forthcoming. Um, and maybe Dr. Garrett has a different opinion. I'd, I'd love to hear it. Yeah, I don't, I don't think that I, I uh, disagree with you, Captain Glacius. Um, you know, I think uh, in terms of looking at uh, Latin America, thinking about Venezuela, thinking about um, President Trump uh, took efforts to uh, basically call Maduro uh, a dictatorship, uh, his regime a dictatorship. And I don't think necessarily that the Biden administration, uh, potential Biden administration would change courses on that and recognize uh, Maduro. Um, there are some differences in how, if you look at the Obama administration, how they responded with uh, Cuba versus what uh, President Trump has done. And so I don't know if Biden would uh, go back to sort of the way that the Obama administration has responded. But I do think that a lot of the key differences in terms of interacting with Latin America would have to do with immigration policy and the way that uh, the Trump administration has put pressure on different nations to revise their policies to try and uh, prevent immigration uh, to deal with asylum seekers and keep asylum seekers within their borders. So I see uh, some of the key differences being there um, versus maybe some of the responses to something like uh, Venezuela, maybe some differences with Cuba. But I don't know, Dr. McCoy, would you agree with that? Those are just sort of uh, projections of what uh, some are maybe guessing might be responses. Yeah, I mean, as I started with, I think that, um, you know, immigration policy uh, uh, it, it is probably the most uh, swing policy that will, the, the, the policy area that has the most significant impact um, uh, from the election. And and yeah, I mean, I, I, I want to leave, we have a few more minutes left, so I want to see if maybe we can squeeze in one more question. And I think the points about, you know, Venezuela, uh, Cuba are, are strong ones. And just in general, the uh, political and continued economic um, volatility that we see uh, in South America. I, I can imagine in the next four years that going um, becoming a major significant issue, and as was said, uh, an area that's you know too too much overlooked. All right, and one final question I mentioned a little bit earlier in conversation, but one student was wondering um, how could a President Biden heal the issues between NATO and the G7, um, specifically in strengthening American trust around the world? Garrett. Dr. Garrett. So, I mean, I think that uh, that's one of the things that. Biden has mentioned in his campaign that one of his goals is to restore perceptions of the United States. I think he actually mentioned uh, during one of uh, a campaign event back in 2019 that if he was elected, the very first group that he would call would be NATO. And he would actually say, you know, okay, we're back, we're, we're on board. So that's one of the things that he would signal, that he signaled that he would try and um, reestablish strong partnerships with uh, some of our allies. So that's something that he's talked about on the, the campaign trail as being something that would be key. He's also um, tried to sort of uh, put a contrast between his own experience having been uh, the chairman on the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations and sort of uh, the connections that he's built with leaders abroad and the experience that he has to sort of contrast what he sees as some of the, the damage that uh, President Trump has done with uh, some of our allies and with some of the strong statements that he's made on NATO. So I think that that's something that um, President Bi that, uh, that uh, Vice President Biden has talked about on the campaign trail. Is there any follow-up, Captain Glacius or Dr. McCoy? Yeah, j j just kind of a question to both you and, and Dr. McCoy. So uh, as we know, NATO was created in the late 1940s in the aftermath of World War II to contain the Soviet Union. Well, the Soviet Union's gone, but there's this other country called Russia that you know is growing rapidly as well. So I guess my question to you colleagues is, can, can, we, can we still uh, preserve the integrity of the original mission 
of, uh, of NATO by focusing just on the former Russian uh, Republic, which was part of the USSR. You know, I, 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 I wish uh, I wish Dr. McGraw were here because um, he because he's a much bigger NATO believer than I am. Um, I've shared this with some of the U.S. foreign policy students who are uh, in my class this semester. Uh, last semester, I was such an open NATO skeptic that students actually wrote final papers just to argue with me. Um, I will say this, and this hasn't gotten any attention tonight, and I think it's something we should talk about before we close out, is that um, President Trump was impeached over a foreign policy issue. Like he was impeached over um, allegedly coercing Ukraine to investigate his political opponent. And Ukraine was a country being threatened by Russia. And the United States has actually made a security guarantee to Ukraine that when it gave up its nuclear weapons, returned them to Russia as part of a nuclear deal signed in 1996, it would defend Ukraine. And the United States, you know, President Obama didn't follow up on that commitment. Uh, President Trump, to me, tripled down on that failure of commitment by like threatening to not provide them with arms unless they dig up, dig up their, their opponent. And so coming back to the original question of trust, I think there's a lot of distrust the United States internationally. There's also a lot of distrust towards the United States internally within our own foreign policy institutions in terms of the ways he treated people within those institutions during the prior to and during the whole impeachment crisis. And so I think a rebuilding of that trust, not only for President Biden, but even for President Trump too, so much trust needs to be rebuilt internationally and needs to be rebuilt within our institutions. And to your question, Captain Iglesias, I think part of that rebuilding needs to be about what is NATO about? Is NATO an anti-Russian alliance? And if it is, are we surprised that Russia acts defensively? Again, uh, Dr. McGraw can yell at me about this tomorrow, but I don't think we can say like, if, you, if it's an anti-Russia alliance, are we surprised that Russia feels like we're hostile towards them? So I think part of the trust building needs to also be about recent, like, what is the point of NATO and having that real discussion about it? Well, thank you so much to our speakers, um, Captain Glacius, Dr. McCoy, and Dr. Garrett. Also, thank you to all the students who submitted questions. Um, and thank you to FPE. I'm going to hand it over to Brett for last words. Yes, uh, we're so thankful that you all could join us uh, for this JQAS event. Uh, the John Quincy Adams Society is going to have uh, hopefully at least one more event this semester. Uh, we will let everyone know when that occurs. Um, if you'd like to be added to our email list, please just send an email to jqaswheaton at gmail.com uh, and we will add you to that. We will also be launching an internship series with short videos uh, highlighting students who've interned in the arenas of international affairs and foreign policy uh, so that you can learn more about those experiences as well. Uh, thank you again to our panelists, uh, and we hope you all have a wonderful evening.